Good morning, and uh, thanks for inviting us to this uh, important conference on open science and open research. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to come over and, and to, to present what we are doing in Brussels, but moreover, I'm, I, st I uh, stayed the whole day because I'm also very interested to hear what is going on here, because uh, there is indeed a momentum, uh, I think, in, on, on, the, on this issue in Europe on making policy. We, uh, and it's very important, therefore, for us to, <coughs> to hear what is uh, going on in uh, this part uh, of, of, of the continent. And uh, as, you, as you will see from, from what I present, uh, there is a lot of things in the pipeline, a lot of things um, going on. A lot of the issues we are tackling are the also on the conference today. So I'm uh, very much looking forward to, uh, to that, uh, to that uh, exchange of ideas and, and listening to to what your concerns and, and particularities here are. So, uh, <coughs> sorry. So this is what I'm going to say. I have only 20 minutes, so I go a bit faster. This is my boss, Carlos Moedas, uh, who was as uh, incoming commissioner two years ago, so he's no longer incoming, eh? so he's uh, halfway now, uh, picked up, as you know, the, the issue of open science very quickly as part of his trio's uh, priority setting and um, open science, open innovation, open to the world. And um, it, he's propagating this, uh, this, this view that open science is about a systemic change in the modus operandi of science and research, and it affects the whole life cycle of um, the scientific process as well as all the stakeholders. So it is not only about open access, it's not only about new ways of measuring impact, it's not only about open data, it's about the whole, the whole cycle and the whole circles. And that is actually a slide we use a lot to, to, to show what is going on. If you look at the way research has been done traditionally, it's, it's the inner five, the pentagram, if you want. There you go from a concept to data gathering, analysis, testing, publication, and so on. Now, what is open science? Open science is that at every level of this process, you get new ways, collaborative ways, open ways of doing things. And the, w when we really started looking into seriously is when we saw all these names appearing. So it was no longer a, a concept of uh, a few freaks sitting somewhere in the library or in, or in, a, in a lab uh, trying to do things differently. You saw a whole ecosystem of services and standards for doing open science, for doing open research. And for measuring and translating the impact of it, you saw it emerging. And you have only a few examples there, but there are hundreds of startups, there are hundreds of uh, profit, uh, not for profit, public private partnerships uh, emerging, which precisely address this new way of doing uh, science and research, which we call altogether uh, uh, open science. And, and that is why we think this is a system change which is emerging now, which is being developing now, and it's also now that we need to, to have uh, in place policies to make sure that we have the best out of it uh, for, uh, for Europe. Interestingly enough, this is a, a recent, I just included it uh, two days ago, because this is a recent analysis of the, of the publishing uh, sector. So STM is the lobby of, uh, of the, the big publishers, and they do every X uh, a kind of a forecast of what are the trends and the technologies affecting their business. And what you see there is, this, they call it the sea of change of open science and open data. So you see exactly the same kind of, um, of, of uh, analysis and of awareness of the fact that the world of science and research will no longer be the world as we used to know it until 15, 20 years ago. That, 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 that is a, 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 a view that is be becoming widespread now throughout the, the whole system. I, I can tell you that three, four years ago, this was not so the case. Eh? So this kind of consensus on, on what is going on is, is a new fact, and that, that also is uh, very encouraging because that makes things uh, a bit easier from the policy point of view. <coughs> I would like to uh, very quickly uh, uh, also indicate that uh, the, the change of open science and, and the move towards open data and open research is more than only a few uh, as, as a hobby, if you want. It is really affecting our scientific system. And our scientific research system in Europe is a very important sector of our societies. We tend to forget that. There are not many figures available, but the, the lower universities, you know, the 24, well, now there are 26, uh, the 26 universities that they, which are considered as the most, one of the, some of the most research intensive universities of Europe, they made a, um, an, an econometric assessment of their 
gross uh, added value, seven, 71 billion, and the number of jobs that they employ as universities, one, close to one million. Now, if, the, if you extrapolate that and you, you, you diminish it, you calibrate your calculations to the 2,700 universities Europe is counting, you immediately see that if the system change affects uh, 2,700 universities, it, it really affects a, sim a significant part of our economy and a, sin a significant part of at least our knowledge intensive related to jobs. So it is more than, a, than, than being concerned about open access and open data. If we think about the policies for open science, it is really about taking care of an important sector uh, of, our, of our societies. And, and it, it, there are more people employed in research than in the car industry, just to give you a little uh, example. So we should take it at least as serious. Now, that, that's the introduction. If I, if I then uh, want to explain you what our policy is, it's very important that you understand where the policy comes from. Because it was not invented by a few people in Brussels sitting in their office and trying to find out something to keep them busy. Uh, it, it was really a, a bottom-up process of, of developing the concerns, the issues, and the policies with regard to open science where we are today. First of all, we started uh, working on this at the end of 2013 and started preparing a big consultation, which we did in 2014 during the summer. So we send around an analysis, we send around questions. I'm sure many of you um, have seen this or, or have uh, responded to it because the response to this questionnaire was quite 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 impressive. Uh, I, I think that all stakeholders and all institutional players, be it private or public, be it universities, libraries, funders, publishers, almost everyone uh, uh, replied and we, we got close to 60 position papers, which we didn't even ask for. So that means that we, we touched something which was quite important. On that basis, we made a synthesis. We proposed um, together with the stakeholders in validation workshops which we did across uh, the continent, spoke to hundreds of people, hundreds of stakeholders, and on that basis we made our policy agenda. So it is not the other way around, it was not an agenda first invented in Brussels and then sold to the rest of Europe, it was completely the other way around. And it's important because if, if, we, if, we, if we speak about our policy, we always say it is a co-design, co-development policy. It is something together, commission with member states and with stakeholders in, in, in particular. That approach has proven to be, uh, I think, the, probably the, uh, a good one because we got very quickly support by the member states, by the councils. Well, you see all the all the dates there, and we got we were we were uh, able to translate it into the top priority, the policy priorities of uh, the Juncker Commission. So, what are the key issues, which on the basis of this process, 2014-2015? of co-design and co-decision, which we were um, able to put forward as the key priorities and concerns for policy that most people in Europe uh, agree on. I mean, in our sector, of course, uh, in, in the scientific and in the research sector. First of all, the issue of incentives. Uh, if you want to open data, you need to incentivize the researchers that, being, that opening up their data is good for their career. It's not only good for their research, it's also good for their career. So incentives is a very important issue. Secondly, new complementary ways to measure the production of scientific, uh, to measure the output of scientific production. So the whole system is now actually only looking at at uh, the high impact journal factor type of, of uh, indicators, whereas if you go for an open data, open research environment, you can very well think of uh, the impact of your blog, the impact of your data uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a producer, as an important measure for uh, what your pr productivity is all about. But of course, that only makes sense if the first point, the incentives, is also taken serious. Uh, for example, some, some American universities you, if you cannot tick the box that, that uh, you, you, you published in open journals and you published in open repositories, it is not used against your tenure track uh, application, but it is not used in favor of it either. So that's the kind of uh, things we are talking about. Thirdly, scientific publishing is changing. We are now uh, mainly in a subscription-based model. We are thinking that we are going towards a much more open, free access download model in the not too distant future. So that's a big change. That really means that you're going from CDs to Apple iTunes or to, to uh, Spotify, if you want. So it's the same kind of logic platforms 
for uh, publishing? Uh, is that happening here as well? And if so, what, is, what are the consequences? Because don't forget, scientific publishing is one of the few remaining industries in Europe where we still lead, so we have to, be, we have to take that uh, very serious as well. So, as you can imagine, that's a quite heated uh, topic, which actually uh, was, was uh, two, three weeks ago again discussed at the uh, Frankfurter uh, Buchmesse with some of the top publishers in Europe. Fourthly, how to promote fair open data, findable, accessible, interoperable, and, and reusable. Uh, no way you can do data-driven science across the disciplines, across the continent, across the member states, if there are not certain principles whereby these data can be shared, found, uh, uh, cross-linked, and so on. Easy to say, not so easy to, to, to develop, and, and luckily, in, in particular in your countries, in particular in Finland, there are uh, uh, quite a few people very, very active here. And uh, yesterday we had, for example, a meeting with some of the, the RDA people, Research Data Alliance people, which are doing a great job there in helping us defining the standards, the meta standards, and so on, which is really a, an important thing. It's a little bit reinventing the internet, but then for research data, if you want. So if you if you take that into account, it took 15 years more or less to make the internet stable. Well, we are there. We are facing a similar challenge, but now for data-driven science and, and data. Then we have the open science cloud. All these data are fine, but where to, where to find them, where to use them, how to make it accessible, that's, that's where the idea of an open European open science cloud uh, 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 e e emerged. And that is something, in the, second, in the first meeting we had in 2014 about uh, validating our results, this is something that quickly came up as, as an important issue by, by all by all researchers and stakeholders we interviewed. Actually, the first one, the rewards and the, and the science cloud were the two key topics that came up uh, quite, quite uh, uh, immediately. So that is, that is taking a, a, lot of, a lot of our time. Um, some of the uh, people that we, that, that we work with are sitting here in the room, so I'm, I'm really pleased to, to see them here. But that is a big, big topic for, uh, for our work, uh, because as you can imagine, it's, it's relatively easy to say, well, we need a trusted environment for doing data-driven research where you can bypass or where, where you can do research in, in, a, in a way that is compatible with the laws and compatible with, uh, with openness. But to, to make it happening, given the fact that there are all so many players uh, uh, in, in the room, is, is not so easy. Research integrity, citizen science, open education and skills as an important factor to support uh, open science also uh, were listed as some of our top priorities to work on. But the first, far, the first five ones are the, the ones we are actually working on today and for which we have developed some very ambitious goals together with, with our commissioner. Uh, and, and you see them listed there. Um, I, I, I suppose the PowerPoint will, will be shared so you can, you can read it there. So the goals are there, open data, default in Horizon 2020, and hopefully in Europe by 2020, the science cloud up and running by 2020, new ways to measure uh, productivity uh, to, to complement the existing uh, impact factor approaches, and so on, uh, open access for all publications by 2018. So you can see we, we, had a, we, we developed a, a, a quite big am ambition there. On top of that, um, we, 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 uh, we decided to create uh, an open science policy platform, which I will tell you in the remaining, remaining minutes left. And all these eight topics will be supported by expert groups, workshops, and so on. And, and please, the, the more of you that join in, uh, the better. So in, this, uh, in the Competitiveness Council of uh, May 2016, which is the, the major political environment where our issues are discussed. The, uh, the creation of the Open Science Policy Platform was, was announced and the commissioner um, made an engagement that he will report every time there is a competitiveness council, meaning twice a year, on the progress made on the Open Science Policy Agenda, so on the eight topics. So that's a very firm political commitment from our side, from the side of the commissioner. And the tool to get there and to help us is, of course, the Open Science not, of course, is the Open Science Policy Platform. The platform is, in the spirit of, of bottom-up, stakeholder-driven co-design, it is a collection of 25 individuals representing the main stakeholders of science in Europe. It was elected via an open call. 
we got much more uh, uh, people people uh, uh, proposed was not applying but proposed than we could then we could get so we will use everyone who was not elected if some of you uh, are there uh, in the room we will certainly come back to you and, and use you as a kind of a second circle of, of expertise but it is really an instrument to advise the commissioner and ourselves on what are the issues what are we doing is it the, co the correct way of doing things and vice versa uh, the, the, the policy platform was also the right of initiative. Whatever uh, the, the platform thinks we should address, we, we, we will take uh, very serious. So it is a, you see some of the members there, that are, uh, I invite you to detect the Finnish member. Uh, she will speak after me. And then um, the, the, the main goals are, are, are there. So catalyze, so catalyze the transition towards open science in Europe as a top level advisory board identify the issues and connect the issues so to keep the systemic view together because what we if we really want to to realize a system change we must we must uh, make sure that we have that we have uh, a system view well I, I will i will skip you the details but that's how it is organized uh, in inside because there are a lot of other players there we inside the house so i'm, I'm also responsible for the dgrtd task force on open science, so trying to mainstream everything across the DG, we do we do work a lot together with Connect, in particular for the for the open science cloud. And it was together with them that we did the paper uh, on on um, uh, in in May 2000 in April uh, of this year on, on on the cloud and data infrastructure, and so on. So we had already one meeting the in the 19th of September, another one in December, another one next year in in, in March. So you see that the, the machinery is is going on. Uh, and uh, in the minute left, <laughs> I was just shown. Uh, let me let me also. There are two more slides, so it was almost perfect timing. So uh, what is really interesting to see is that this whole debate of open science is no longer a European debate. Uh, the, the, the the discussion on on a science cloud. In Australia, they call it different. In the US also, and in Japan as well. But it is discussed. The same, exactly the same topics are discussed across the globe in the G7. Uh, with two weeks ago, we had a, a, a working meeting for to prepare the G7 for next year on, on open science, where we, will, where we will focus on open data slash the cloud and, and on the reward system. So you see this emerging as a, as a, global, as a global topic, which is uh, at a, I would say, not, not maybe not the first priority of the science and technology ministers across the globe, but certainly one of their top uh, priorities. And that's quite encouraging, uh, in particular if, if, I, if I go back to the introduction of, of, of our moderator, it's probably one of the few areas uh, where, where there still is a view that things are global and not, um, uh, not, not uh, local. So this is what we are doing there and, and the policy platform, we also hope them to play a role in this because the, the, the next G7 uh, science and technology is in April uh, next year, in, in after the summer. So that we will ask the, their support there as well. Idem ditto for the G20, but anyway, you can, you can read it there. But you see, just to illustrate you, it's no longer a European discussion, it's, it's a global discussion. And that, by the way, is makes it extremely challenging, but also rather complicated, because if, if, if we think science cloud for Europe, fine, it's already not easy to come up with the rules of the game amongst ourselves in Europe. What will we do in, uh, to, to, uh, if, if we translate that at the global, at the global level? Because uh, Science by default is, is global, so how will we come up with a, a kind of an equitable uh, policy which, which we can make work uh, globally because, as you can imagine, it's not uh, that easy. So in one word, in the last three seconds, uh, so it is uh, really uh, exciting, I would say, for a policymaker in, 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 in this field because we are no longer talking about the vision and a, and a change, we are talking about an implementation and a reality, and that is, I think, for policymakers, probably the closest you can get to Nirvana slash the clouds. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jean-Claude Burgelman. And uh, now we will hear commentary from Christi Christina hormia Poutanen, who is director of Library Network su Services at the National Library.
dear colleagues, <clears throat> it's very nice to, nice to be here. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. So it is very positive that the European Commission has taken such a strong role in fostering open science. The process until now has been systematic and has focused both on creating in incentives, as we heard earlier Jean-Claude Burgelman uh, explain, and also removing barriers. It has been a bottom-up bottom uh, approach, and also co-design was, was stressed, and we all welcome these kind of approaches. Europe can be seen as a forerunner in enabling open science. I visited Japan last, last week, and heard that the Japanese government has launched an open science program in 2015. Japan is interested in collaboration with Europe and uh, possibly also with European countries such as Finland. Uh, and they are interested especially in collaboration regarding uh, cloud infrastructures. LIBER, the Association of European Research Libraries, has chosen open science as the core of the strategy. The vision of our next strategy is libraries powering sustainable knowledge in the digital age. I, I'm very happy that libraries have a seat at the open science policy platform. I think this is also a recognition of the activities we have had over the past past few years. And I hope really that, uh, that we, we can give a strong input in, in the work. My comments uh, to Jean-Claude's presentation relate to open science cloud, open access and new publishing models as well as the TDM. First, the European open science cloud. It is important that the development of European Open Science Cloud involves both top-down and bottom-up approach to gain the trust of funders and researchers. Ultimately, it is the researcher supported by an ecosystem of social and technical enables who have the power to realize open science. Key issues, connecting institutional consortial national and European infrastructures to add value. Transparency of governance and ownership. It is critical that the open science cloud is open in all aspects, not just its outputs. Governance, funding, mo funding models and the structure of the cloud should be transparent. Diversity. <coughs> the challenge for European open science cloud is how to deal with diverse and heterogeneous datasets, as well as big data. Flexibility and engagements, progress via small-scale pilots and ex experiments is important. Collaboration, communication, raising awareness and training. We believe that libraries have a key role in advocacy and raising awareness and engaging new actors, such as citizen scientists, by providing guidance, training, and support. I have here some suggestions for uh, EU, for, for the next te steps on EU level. Strengthening interoperability and federation on semantic level. And here in Finland, we are quite advanced, so we are happy to share our experiences. Supporting skills and knowledge building, Recognition of existing or evol evolving related infrastructures, building heterogeneous distributed ecosystem. Identifying what is missing and bridge the gaps. Progress via small scale pilots. Communication of results, open research data, how it has been utilized in research and industry. Are there new discoveries or uh, all business? Um, so my text, next topic is uh, open access and new business models. So according to the European Member States commitment, open access should be the default by 2020. We are not there yet. Finland is negotiating big deals with several publishers this year. Today we have with Elsevier later, later, later today. Uh, according to the proposals we have received, some publishers are willing to move towards immediate open access, but not all. 
The total cost of access, taking into account subscription costs and APC costs, is increasingly, increasing rapidly. This trend has to be stopped. And actually, a couple of days ago in Finland, uh, we published a website, website where we collect signatures from researchers to support uh, our goals in our negotiations. So key issues in, in uh, open access and new business models. Transparency <coughs> of, of costs. Uh, we have to encourage new players in open access publishing, uh, create new business models, and one, mo one model is not uh, enough. Raise awareness of the benefits among researchers and uh, re-app the rewards of repositories. Some suggestions. Increase transparency via case examples, for example. Pilot new business models, for example, scientific society publishing, including small languages. Pilot new publishing workflows with different stakeholders. And possibly launch a European mega journal. Now, I think I don't have time to say anything about TDM, but I could say that we are not happy yet with the proposal which we have on, on table, so it's not enough. TDM should be allowed for both commercial and non-commercial non research. Thank you.